I used to subscribe to a newspaper in Britain called The Independent. Um, the Independent is a liberal, environmental newspaper um, specialized in running stories like this on, on, on climate change. This was a three-page story, both starting with the front page, the melting mountains, on the third page, talking about the decline and potential elimination of the entire alpine skiing industry. Um, this is fairly typical of the kind of coverage it used to give. I can imagine for many people in North America a dream to have a newspaper that, that goes into such detail on a climate change issue. Um, but it was a Saturday edition of a newspaper, so you can imagine it has its different little parts and, 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 and little, little supplements and things. And much to my surprise, picking up the newspaper and giving it a little shake, out fell the travel supplement. <laughs> the travel supplement, incidentally, the article having said 50 years before the skiing industry is out of business for travel supplement, giving you maybe a ski resort so you could go to, to each year before you end up skiing on gravel. Every single one of these ski resorts involves a flight. So here we have a very interesting uh, internal contradiction that the newspaper is saying this is a threat. It is advocating that people go and see the thing which is at threat by the very means of its own destruction. It's fairly typical of a kind of internal contradictions with moral conflicts in climate change all the time. I think what is interesting, though, is you could say, oh, it's just a newspaper, it's, like, it's, you know, it's, it's making money from adverts, it's saying different things. No, it isn't. The newspaper knows very well what its market is. It knows very well that the readers of The Independent, largely well-educated, upper-middle-class people, better-off people, are very concerned about climate change and very concerned about skiing holidays. And they are the, they are the same people. Just as we ourselves in our own minds are the same people. We are very concerned, I imagine most of us in the room about climate change, we are also very concerned and interested in things which create climate change in just the way that they do. This is not a hypocrisy, this is an internal contradiction inherent in the issue of climate change. It is one of the key reasons why climate change is so hard for us to deal with. Then these internal contradictions appear all over the place. I'm fascinated by the way that this appears in ways we don't even recognize in, in the public realm. This, for example, is on the Guardian website. You can, you can read it for yourself. This is two, <laughs> two conflicting, con contradictory messages laid right next to each other in, in stark juxtaposition. We don't even notice these things anymore that they're so ubiquitous. Piles of magazines, for example, on magazine racks put out completely contradictory messages at the same time, speaking to different interests and different parts of us. We, we know that Human brains are wired to pay attention to things, and it's one of the things I will talk about. We also know, however, that our brains are wired to ignore things. And uh, the most recent cognitive research is suggesting that the process of disattention is more important than the process of attention. In other words, the, the choice of us not to pay attention to things is basically what keeps us sane. It's also what makes the entire modern world possible. If we were not able to ignore and not pay attention to things, we would not be able to have a world of a scale and complexity we have now. If our brains could only really handle looking at the faces of the 20 people in our hunter-gatherer group, I would not be able to stand in this room now without running away and hiding. I have to say, interestingly, I have hosted people from hunter-gatherer groups standing in front of groups like this, and they don't run away and hide either even though they have probably never been in a group of so many people at one time. So there is the ability of our brains to decide what to focus on and what to ignore. When we look at that pile of magazines, we create a frame around, and of course in the language of uh, cognitive linguistics, we can talk about frames, frames of attention. Irving Goffman, of course, talking about frames of attention, attention uh, frames of disattention. We, dis we put, first of all, the first thing we do is we create frames around all of these individual pieces of information, and then we decide whether or not we might select for ones that we want. I suggest that the, the majority of people would remove that. Interestingly, if you said to them, could you point out to me, please, for a magazine that it's dealing with climate change and like, whatever, the end of the world, then they would readily know it's there. However, it's not the one which triggers. I suggest many of us in the room would probably look at that pile of magazines and focus on that one. So there is this process of attention and disattention which is deeply fascinating. Let's hold that thought for one moment. The other thing, which is a key theme of what I want to talk about, is how we construct narratives and stories around climate change in order to make sense of this very complex, nebulous, and I suggest kind of like wriggly, squiggly issue. 
Here's a very interesting, here's a very interesting experiment. Oh, actually, I'm so sorry. It's because I'm working from old sheet notes. This happens every single time. So every time I give a presentation, I, I, I change my presentation. Um, the conversation between the different panels, we may try and ignore it, but of course, in the sense of art, and artists explore this the whole time, we know very well that the conversation between the panels is as important as the actual content in them. I'm a, a lifelong comics fan. In the psychology of comics, how we read and, and, and how, how we read the storyline of the comics, it is not just what is happening in the panel, it is what we create between the panels, the conversation between them. This story is incomprehensible unless you fill in the gaps between the separate parts of the, of the story. Therefore, I think the fact that we have these juxtapositions is not just simply a matter of us saying, I pay attention to that and I ignore that. We actually have an internal conversation and a disconnection happening between them. That creates a state of tension that we seek to resolve. This tension is present the whole way through the climate change debate, as I was talking with George about. I'll come back to a point later about disinvesting. So let's look at the narratives that people use as well. This is a very interesting uh, little piece of film which came out two, three weeks ago. A documentary film company went out into the streets of Dublin sat people down on a bar stool. Now, the logic of this is that in, in Ireland, bars are the places where people have conversations. So let's take a bar stool out into the street and let's have people talking on it about climate change. I don't, I don't know why they thought this was a comfortable thing to do, to perch on a bar stool in the middle of a road, but this is what they did. Now, listen, as we go through this, Listen not just to what people are saying, but listen in an analytical sense about how what they're saying are familiar, pre-constructed, pre-formed social narratives around climate change. See how interesting this is. This is part of what I do for my work is actually getting people talking about things and then trying to do a discourse analysis on what they say. That's a, that's a very interesting and very typical spread of things. The first thing to notice is that what people are saying are not, are not necessarily considered or formed by themselves, but they're chosen from a range of available narratives to actually fit whoever they are, their lifestyle and their, their, their personal politics. It's no surprise, for example, that the people who are putting up the story about, how, about, about the corruption of money are the people who let's face it, we can, we can tell looking at it probably from um, more, more marginal or, or more, uh, more alternative lifestyles. Um, it's, no, it's no surprise to me that the interesting one, that, that very first one there, where she says, uh, yeah, climate change, it's, uh, it's this, it's that, it's, it's recycling, that kind of thing. And you can see in the ironic way that she's saying that, but she's aware that there's a kind of earnestness there that she's seeking to undermine. Of course, recycling and climate change have very little in contact. I mean, we know recycling uses energy and resources, absolutely, and that it's part of the solutions. 
I have to say recycling is not the first thing which comes to mind when we think about the causes and solutions to climate change. It is, however, very firmly within the cognitive map of doing things for the world. So it sits there. The fellow who said um, polar bears. Yeah, polar bears. Tan. I love the tan. That's interesting, isn't it? That's like the, that's like the skiing holiday. But, the, but the, the polar bears, the penguins, these things don't exist, but people have fought through them. Those ideas and those images have been placed there quite, quite dangerously wrongly, in my view. They're very, very poor and weak uh, metaphors for climate change. But even the man, and we might be going, ah, OK, here's somebody who seems to know what he's saying. 97% of scientists. That is just, as we know, a constructed narrative. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a campaign argument. It is based on evidence and research. Naomi Oreskes and um, um, Skeptical Science have done a, a, a good job going through and work, coming to that figure. But that figure also exists as a, socially, as a socially transferred story. But these are the stories people are telling. I'm kind of also interested in the stories that people are not telling. Just as there's a whole realm of information, there's actually a whole realm of non-information. Not even disinformation, non-information. Things that are not known and things that are not talked about. This, by the way, is a, an interesting campaign run by uh, a Canadian uh, campaigner, which is, um, as you can see, it's a, it's a building in Ottawa, do not talk about climate change here, actually, strangely located in Washington. But these posters, do not talk about climate change, appear, <laughs> appeared all over in busy streets. I kind of like that. I like calling it on that. Because the non-conversation about climate change is actually much larger and more powerful than the, than the conversation. Um, there is a widely distributed Silence on climate change. Most people, talk ab Most people, if you ask them how much they talk about it, they hugely over-report. They actually talk about it much less than they think that they do. We know a third of people cannot recall a single conversation they've ever had on climate change. We know t most of the remaining two-thirds of people have never talked about climate change with anyone other than their immediate family and friends. And we know from our own, because life's an experiment after all, we know from our own experience that, that if we try and raise climate change with people who uh, do not share our concern, the conversation just, just dies. I have a good friend, Mayor Hillman, who's a, a, an academic who's really championed climate change, a great advocate, came to him as a kind of revelation. And like people who are late converts, like he, he really took it on board. And Mayor was at a dinner party with... Um, guests like him, people who are retired, professionals, they had good pensions, and they were talking about the pleasures of retirement, about the cruises they were taking, about the, 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 the holiday trips, the flights they were taking to Australia to see their families. The mayor took about as much of this as he could handle at this dinner party, and he finally, he finally exploded. He said, what are you talking about? Don't you realise what those flights are doing to the world we live in? You're talking about visiting your grandchildren, you're destroying their future. Because this is how he talks. It's, a, it's a, probably a reason that he doesn't get invited to many dinner parties. <laughs> but what is interesting, the way that Mayor tells the story, what is interesting is that there was total silence. Then one of the women at the table said, My word, what a lovely spinach tart. <laughs> yes, indeed, what a lovely spinach tart it was. How delicious. What is the recipe? So fresh. This is a lovely tart. Med talks about this as a spinach tart strategy of, of social, social disavow by totally changing the conversation, going somewhere else of it. And he said that what was most peculiar about this was the obsessive attention that they paid to this bloody tart. And he just went on and on and on about the tart. Ten minutes. And then having safely decontaminated the conversation, they then just moved on as if nothing at all had happened. I met a guy called uh, Eviata Zerubabel, who's the probably world's expert on socially constructed silence. And I, he, he liked this story very much. Because although he hasn't worked on climate change, he says it's fairly typical of what you get with socially constructed silences. But there is a silence which is bounded by the rules of conversation. People who study human rights abuses say similar things happen with human rights too. But there are contracts and agreements that societies enter into without even having talked about the agreement about what they can publicly knowledge and, and not knowledge. In other words, attention and distention is not just working on an individual level, it's working on a social level. But socially, without even defining it, we work out what things can be publicly recognized and not recognized. It's an extremely interesting area, and I would love people to do more research on it. The, the social silence, I found it. Much to my surprise, extended into areas where you would not at all 
expected. I uh, went and did a number of interviews in areas that have been affected by extreme weather events. In Texas, uh, I went to Bastrop County, where a third of the town of Bastrop burnt down in the most severe wildfires ever experienced in Texan history. Following in Bastrop County, the worst drought ever recorded. Um, I mean, by an order tenfold magnitude more property destroyed in Bastrop fires than anything previously in Texan history. And I spoke with a lot of people in, in Bastrop. I did a lot of interviews. Kind of semi, semi rigorous research. I mean, not, not, not like proper research, but like nonetheless, where I was very actively looking for things. So I led the conversations. People told me with great enthusiasm about how wonderful their community was, how it had all come together, how much they loved each other, how strong things were, the extraordinary acts of generosity and kindness for people experienced from strangers. Uh, there was a narrative of um, hope, social strength, rebuilding, rebirth. Then I said to people, tell me about this, you know, these scientists, they're saying stuff about climate change. Was this anything that's been discussed? No. Could you, could you tell me the last conversation you, you had with anyone about climate change in regards to the wildfires? No. No one could rem recall a single conversation that they had ever had. Um, even the, uh, even the, the editor of the town magazine said, sure, we would cover this issue if it was relevant to Bastrop County. <laughs> I went, well, well, bearing in mind that even your state climatologist has been making the connection, and every scientist, you know, and world scientists of 25 years have said that climate change might very well lead to greater droughts and greater wildfires, there might be that connection. So you go, no, 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 no. This is just a small county paper. We just deal with local things. What was, <laughs> what was interesting was when I went to, that's Republican Texas, when I went to Democrat New Jersey, I found something very, very similar. But the narratives were built around, as I said, about strength, hope, rebuilding. The community is absolutely s smashed by climate change. I went five years after Hurricane, sorry, five months after Hurricane Sandy. And the devastation was, was still staggering. I met this lady here, Dinah Long. Dinah is the charismatic mayor of Seabright. Amongst, ooh, I think I probably did about 20 interviews in, uh, along the New Jersey seashore. I asked Dinah, I said, Dinah, here's, a, here's an interesting situation. She accepts climate change, by the way. I said, how about, how about you and the mayors of other towns along the New Jersey seashore, how about you get together and you go to Congress and you say, look, climate change is real, we're feeling it, we want to have action now. And she just laughed in my face. She said, are you crazy? She said, like, duh. She said, of course climate change is happening. But we'll just leave that lofty stuff to another day. Even, so here's a situation, and I have to say, Although Dinah admitted to climate change privately, she said she would not be talking about it within her own community because there were people there who were doubtful about climate change and she wasn't going to irritate, or irritate them or, or put them off. Other people I spoke to, not a single person on the New Jersey seashore I spoke to could recall a single conversation they'd had about climate change in regards to, to Hurricane Sandy. Despite the fact that wider, it seems to us self-evident. Evident. However, they were, in the, they were in the middle of a storm. And in the middle of a storm, you want to have an optimism bias towards the future turning out well. You are not going to be, as you rebuild your house and you reinvest your life, you are reinvesting in a hopeful and optimistic vision of a future that does not include a, a re, a, any repetition of what you've been through for a long time. So it's clear that... <laughs> This is a very interesting question. People who are not affected by climate change are not engaging with it. People who have been through major storms are having problems with it. And remember, I, I stress this is, not, this is not hard science. This is, merely, this is merely anecdotal. But what is interesting in all of these cases, how we interpret this is going through these, is going through these socially constructed narratives. People sometimes talk about climate change as a psychological blind spot. Um, I, I can see the sense of that, the, the point of a blind spot being that there's something there that is there, but with a blind spot, the brain is very clever to cover it over, so it's, I, ooh, it's just there. And, but, but I can't see a big hole there, it's patched in around it. I'm not, I'm not, sure, that, I'm not sure that a blind spot is quite, is quite the thing. Um, I was thinking about this when I was in New York, um, not long after I'd been to, to New Jersey. And um, I was sitting in the cab, a cab driver. And you know, as cab drivers do, he was talking about the celebrities who'd been in this cab. But well, as they do in New York, I don't know if they do that in uh, Vancouver. Oh, sorry. And, okay, I won't use that joke next time. And 
And he's saying, yeah, he said, I had that Donald Trump in my cab. And we were right. He said, yeah, Donald Trump. He said, and he's got the weirdest effing hair I have ever seen in my life, he said. His hair, wow, doesn't he realize how stupid it looks? <laughs> Donald Trump, if you don't know, is an exponent of the, uh, the master, um, the, the master comb over. This is, and this site here expresses a kind of military <laughs> campaign on his head. I, I'm allowed to talk about comb overs as somebody who could have one, but quite frankly doesn't even have enough to comb over. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Donald's positively hairy compared with me. What I think is interesting, and about why it's a joke, of course, but what I think is, is the point about this metaphor is that, is that climate change is a bit like a comb-over. It's not, or climate change denial. <laughs> OK. <laughs> bear with me here. Bear with me. It starts with a little problem. We're aware that there's a little problem there, and we just kind of just <laughs> comb over a little bit. And it gets bigger, and we comb over a bit more, and bit by bit, the, you know, the parting the parting starts to shift, shift down, down the head until it's like sweeping way over from the back of the head. And, but the point with this being we know that we're doing it. We're fully conscious of the fact there's something going on, but we're not talking about it and we're not recognizing it. Look in the mirror. Yeah, I look fine. You know what you're doing, but you're also in an act of, of express constructed denial. What is more, everyone else around you know. I've got a dear friend who has one of these things, and boy, oh boy, none of us are ever going to talk about it. The, and this is like a whole society where we all have comas. Like we're all involved in active, we're all involved in active denial of something whilst actually not being able to call each other on it. I want to talk for a moment about that's a social construction thing. I'll come back to that in a minute. But I wanted to talk for a moment also about the the the, the brain aspects, the cognitive aspects of climate change. Um, We've known for a long time now. In fact, if you could say, actually, we've known since, you know, since the ancient Greeks that we process information in different ways. Um, in religions, people often talk about you know, the, the movement from the, from the head to the heart. Uh, now, with the benefit since, uh, of some very good uh, experimental research, and of course, now with brain scanning, we're fully aware of the fact that this is actually built into the architecture of our brains but we have different processing systems. Uh, this isn't a, I mean, it's a nice picture, but it doesn't really show it. Of course, it's not like left hemisphere and right hemisphere, um, nor is it actually separate. These are two interlinked systems by which information gets processed differently. What's important is there's a conversation between the two going on. Um, we know that uh, one side, we could say, is analytic reasoning. I might call that the rational side. That's very good at dealing with numbers, data, symbols, logic. It's very good at evaluating risk and strategy. We also know that we have a more emotional side, what psychologists would call affective reasoning, which responds to issues which are much more around proximity, personal experience. That's the side which is very good at evaluating threat rather than risk. It's constantly scanning for social signs about what the people in our peer group are saying or not saying for those rules about attention and disattention. And it deals in a world of metaphor and narrative. Metaphor, both personal experience and also metaphor, linguistic metaphor. That's why, for example, when I'm talking to you about this, I'm going to talk about comb-overs. I'm going to talk about things which is both amusing but also has you thinking in creative ways because I know that's a good way to communicate. We have a problem with this, which is that this is an issue which comes in very, very strongly. The information about it is coming in very, very strongly on that rational side. Not just that the information from the science comes in from the rational side, but the entire culture within which it is embedded, the scientific culture, regards its professionalism as being about speaking to that side of the brain. We could say, we could say that there is a... That there is a a split since the Enlightenment between science and religion whereby, whereby science very actively removes from itself and its language those things which might be distractive bias from the emotional side. I fully understand and respect that. That is professional science. However, it creates a problem in terms of forming socially held belief. We have to find ways of converting climate change from one side to the other. And that's what all of these socially formed narratives are. They are attempts to turn the information from the rational side over to the emotional side. I spoke with a lot of experts in the course of writing the book, and I had the pleasure to have lunch with Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman, of anyone, for any of you who does not know, is the expert on this. In fact, on the, the entire textbook, the entire language of, um, 
the role of cognitive bias in our decision making is written by Daniel Kahneman, Eamon Tversky, he wrote with him, uh, he worked with him, and colleagues. Professor Kahneman said to me, he was very apologetic actually, he's a very, very nice man. You know, um, and he sort, of, he sort of, he looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I said, well, it's great having lunch with you. Oh, he says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I see no hope. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, okay, thanks. That's, that's good. So I see no hope. And then we had this very strange conversation. We had a very big bowl of tomato soup. So the whole way, the whole way through my interview, no hope. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm very <laughs> depressed about this. I went, okay. And the reason he is depressed is very good and very strong. His research shows that there are some things we have a very strong bias to disattend. One of those things are things which are said in the future. One of those things which are things which involve loss. In fact, loss aversion was a major area of his work. Uncertainty is hard. The actual specific construction of things which involve balance short-term losses against long-term losses are things which he says we have very strong biases around. That is to say, but when, when the same when the same balance is expressed in terms of losses as opposed to gains, in terms of short-term, long-term, all these experiments he did which put, the, thank you, which put different formulations he found were very strongly biased. His argument is climate change combines all of the worst of these. From his point of view, in his words, this is the perfect, this is the perfect cognitive challenge because it brings together all of these things. I also spoke at length to Paul Slovic. Paul Slovic, also some, sometimes a, a colleague of Professor Kahneman, um, is the world's expert in social construction of risk. And I said, I said Paul, like, the, is, this not, is this not actually a great thing for our risk, or shouldn't it be? Because it appears to be the things that your research tells us that we respond badly to. It's created out of technology, it creates, uh, it creates anticipation, it creates anticipation, fear, dread, uh, which, is, which is one of his terms. Um, he said no. He said no. He said that there's another problem there, which is that climate change, that climate change appears to be like something we're very familiar with, the weather. And therefore it lays itself completely open for us to interpret it as just another form of something that we are familiar with. Or, in his words, to make up our own mind about whether it is good or bad. In other words, a biased interpretation of an individual weather event we can choose to see as being good or being bad in turn entirely on the basis of what we have already decided. It does not convey a threat unless we choose it to do so. I think putting these two kind of like thoughts together and a lot of other people I've spoken to, I'd suggest that there's actually something else which is going on between this. But the way that we choose to see climate change is constructed in terms of those um, biases. In other words, that there's a background anxiety too which is operating with this. This is challenging, we don't like it, we'd like to avoid it, and it readily complies with that by allowing us to do it. In other words, that we can... I do not agree with Professor Kahneman that the problem with climate change is because it is in the future. I would say the problem is we put it in the future to make sure that we do not have to pay attention to it. In other words, his research is right. We disattend things which are in the future uncertain and involve cost, but we ruddy well make sure that climate change meets all of those criteria so that we don't have to engage with it. This is just one simple example. This is one of proximity. This is the only graph. <laughs> this is a graph-free presentation. This is one graph. This is, this is if you look at the bottom category, like a great deal. Let's take that as the serious line there. You'll see that, that only 10% of people in that far right column believe that climate change will harm them personally. With each stage of remove, more people believe it will be harmful. Your family, your community, people in the US, people in industrialized nations, people in developing countries, future generations, and then finally, other species. The transition of that is so predictable, and it appears in Britain, Canada, and other places. It is also so perfect that I cannot help but feel that people, it is not that people are placing climate change at arm's length quite deliberately, that this is socially constructed. They are not actually in this going on any data or evidence about who will be harmed by it at all. They are simply creating climate change as a narrative of distance. We also know that, we also know that future distance, however, in itself is not an overwhelming obstacle. 
I mean, if we imagine, for example, you can see I like comics, right? If you imagine, if you imagine that there was a, a meteor heading towards the Earth that was going to collide with the Earth in 50 years' time, and we had an exact date for that, January 23rd, 10, 12 in the morning, British time, so it'll be in the middle of the night for you guys so you could sleep through it. This meteor is going to, this meteor is going to crash into the Earth and it's going to throw up a huge plume of dust which will throw the world's weather system perpetually into disarray. But we know that if this was the problem, we would respond differently. There is something else which is going on there. And we can do any number of thought experiments. I'll do some more like this. Where we know that the way we respond to climate change is shaped by the nature of the threat and the images that it creates. And that climate change is a wobbly and tricky one for that. So, let's just suggest this. So, I, I, I don't buy this stuff about how we don't ignore climate change because it's in the future or it's expensive or it's uncertain or it requires sacrifice. We all know from human history that we're capable of all of those things and um, that um, we respond to them all the time. In case of war, we will have any amount of expense and uncertainty. And, uh, expense, and, uh, uncertainty. It's very interesting that the people who say climate change can't be worked on, but it's too uncertain. We'll invest unlimited amount of monies against the greatly more uncertain threat of terrorism. In fact, what's interesting with terrorism is that the uncertainty amplifies the risk rather than reduces it. These things are important, but they're not critical. There's also an argument to say that we don't believe in climate change because the information flow has been corrupted, so that we don't accept the information. But there's an there's a international cr uh, conspiracy of climate change deniers. Yeah, that is true. There is funding which goes into that. I've met some of these people. They're very skilled communicators and they do a very good job. To be honest, better than many of the people on my own side. I mean, <laughs> they've done a very, very good job in persuading people that climate change doesn't exist. However, that is not, in my view, the primary reason. There's plenty of information out there. These people say, why don't they tell us the truth about climate change? Well, why don't you spend 10 seconds on Google, to be honest? Although I have to say my personal interactions are normally slightly more polite than that. I was, um, I was playing around, I, I, um, I like these props, and I was, I was playing around with my son with one of these things because um, we thought they were really, really fun. Here we go. There. there. Um, and, and, and as I was, I was kind of like, afterwards I thought, oh, God, that's so effective, isn't it? Like, well, of course, the reason... The reason it's so, it, it looks better on people who have a full head of hair, I, I have to say. <laughs> Especially if you had a full head of green hair. But the reason, the reason of course, for that, that works so nicely as, a, as an optical illusion is, is because of our, our brain seek. Uh, will always seek to create completeness from scattered pieces of information. So our brains are unable to see this without putting in, the, putting in the arrow in between the two. In fact, I think what's particularly nice about this is that all of the activity there is happening actually between, in, right, right in there, literally what the, what the arrow goes through, is what creates the completeness. It's what the Berlin School would have called the gestalt of completeness um, when, when they were studying that in the kind of like early years of experimental psychology. So, so what... What is, what is interesting, I guess, and why there's, this, again, is like another metaphor for climate change, is that climate change comes with incomplete information and gaps, and that, in a way, what happens is our brain puts for, puts, seeks to put the two together. It yearns for completeness, and, and it yearns for, uh, a, um, a, 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 to create a functioning story out of it. I think what is interesting with this example and again, why this is so compelling to us. And there, is a, there are some things which are just compelling. There are some things we can't take our eyes off. There are some things which really speak to us, of course, because as you're looking at this, you're, you're, you're compelled by it, is that it speaks of an act of violence. If this was something which didn't look like an arrow, it wouldn't be half as effective. Because that violence then immediately, that starts speaking to your emotional brain of threat. And it raises the question of who fired it. Who fired that arrow through the head? Acts of, it, of violence with an intention to cause harm are extremely powerful for us. So, let's take an example with climate change then. I talked about meteors. If we were talking about uh, supposing climate change was caused by North Korea. Supposing, let's, let's flesh it out a little bit, supposing uh, a document of some kind got smuggled out of Pyongyang 
Um, somebody dug their way out and they managed to escape with this document, which proved beyond all question of doubt and confirmed by drones flying over and by satellite imaging that North Korea was pumping gases into the atmosphere with the intention of destroying, these gases had a particular quality, but they had the intention of destroying wheat and grain production across the American Midwest, which of course is what they do. And of course, it's what North Korea is doing, just as we're all doing. In fact, rather ironically, North Korea is doing rather less than we are, because they're a relatively poor country. But if we add in that fact that a known enemy with the intention to cause harm is, is, is causing that devastation, we know that this climate change will be a very, very different problem. There he is, in fact. There, there, there's the proof of it. There's Kim Jong-un with, uh, with, uh, there they are, they're busy pumping the stuff into the atmosphere as we speak, ladies and gentlemen. I think we should be out there marching now, never mind climate change, we are marching for action on North Korea. We know that the presence, we know that the presence of a strong enemy mobilizes us. We also know that climate change, unfortunately, does not offer that. We have an incomplete narrative. We have the parts, we have the cause, we have the effects, we do not have the bit in the middle of the, of the, the, the responsibility. We know that climate change is a moral issue. We know that it is a threat and a, a challenge to future generations and our own children. You don't get more moral than that. And as campaigners, we often present that. But the problem is, how can you present a moral issue without the intention to cause harm? You know, climate change is sometimes talked about as the elephant in the room, um, as the thing which people don't talk about. That's what sometimes people talk about as silence as the elephant in the room. Bill Blakemore, who is the ABC environment correspondent, given a lot of thought to this. And he came up with a very nice formulation. But he said, it was, it was the elephant that we're all inside, he said. This is actually interesting. Napoleon had this mad idea on the Place de Bastille of creating an elephant that you could climb inside. Um, there is actually also, strangely, there's one, in, uh, there's one in Atlantic City, if you're interested in such things. I, I get dangerously distracted by Google image search, so this is... <laughs> But well, I'm well, deciding what I should be talking about. Um, this is called Lucy the Elephant. And if you're interested in what is inside this elephant that apparently we're all inside, um, I think it's kind of suitable. It's got a, it's got a, a sort of a door to the left wing and a door to the right wing. Uh, it's got a television and it's got a, it's got a flag. There we are. I think those are the qualities of being inside the elephant. Not even just elephants either, might I say. Any form of, any form of external enemy would, would mobilize us. Here's something particularly curious. And more secure for you and your children. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all of the local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Bravo, well done Ronnie. Well indeed, indeed so. That is very true. I mean, that's not a major contribution to diplomatic thought. I mean, he's standing in front of the United Nations there, and they was really, really scratching their heads. But he has got a point. If we were under attack from an alien species, I think that we probably would all come together. External enemy with the intention of causing us harm. However, we are inside this elephant. Let's just focus in on intention for the moment, because that is a critical one for us. Children as young as three in experiments can clearly differentiate between things that are the result of accidents and things that are the result of somebody intending to cause someone harm. We are, if we're talking about wiring, we are extremely well wired on, on, on this issue. This is a, this is a, a man who was um, a, former, um, a former policeman in the Austrian police. And he's saying, in police academy, he said, I learned this, he said, a crime to be a crime must meet four requirements, he said. It's got to have a subject, an object, an action, and an intent. I, I read this with a lot of interest. I was reading about this man on holiday. It's maybe a reflection of my own sickness, but I read things like this on holiday because, of course, because of course this is no ordinary man. Having on previous holidays read all about the siege of Stalingrad, 
And um, I was such a trostis, I was very interested to read about him. His name is Fritz Stangl, and if you don't, haven't read this book, I strongly recommend it by Gita Sereni. But Fritz Stangl was the commandant of Treblinka death camp. And under his extremely efficient and professional management, he managed to kill over a million people. What is interesting is he's not a bad man. Well, certainly as Sereni shows up, I mean, obviously in some ways he's completely horrible, but, but he's not a bad man in the sense that he has loving relationships with people. He's a man who has an internal sense of morality. He's certainly, well, I wouldn't say he's certainly not a psychopath. What is interesting, however, is that he could justify his position on the basis of the absence of intent. He could say, sure, he says. In his interview with Sereni, he says, sure, there was a subject. There was a, there was a subject. The, the subject was uh, uh, the death camp. The object was the Jews. And he says, he says, yeah, the action was gassing them. He said, but there was, I had no intent to cause them harm. <laughs> he said, I had nothing against the Jews personally. In fact, I, in fact uh, some of the Jews became my friends. I mean, <laughs> you, you can imagine that's a somewhat one-sided friendship. Um, so, but what is interesting that key thing of in, that, that is that key thing there of intent. So given that climate change does not have an external enemy with the intention to cause harm, where's the, where is the intention with climate change? We, we, the things which cause climate change are us going around our daily lives, heating our homes, driving our kids to school, maybe going for a holiday, maybe, maybe not even a holiday, maybe even flying, maybe even flying somewhere to visit our, our mother. There's lots of positive intention there, and certainly no one thinks, yeah, I'm going to wreck the world. So in the absence of an intent, we have a narrative with a missing core. And therefore, we, I think we tend to put in that core, and this is where it becomes very tricky with climate change. I had a lovely lovely day with a Texan tea party. They were very warm, very generous and hospitable. Thank you. And I stood in front of them. There was about 40 people in the room. I was at the invitation of this lady, Deborah Medina. She ran as the uh, candidate in the uh, Texan gubernatorial elections for the Republican candidacy. She came in third as a wildcat candidate. This is Deborah with her gun. I asked Deborah, I said, you've got any guns? She says, yeah, sure, I've got this gun here. I always keep it down the side of my car seat in case I might need it. it made me slightly nervous. I wasn't, didn't want to go too far about exactly how she defined um, the times when she might need this gun. But these people were very warm and, and friendly. I said, tell me about what you think about climate change. Well, boy, they had a lot of views on this. And their views were all based around enemy narratives about people, well, let's face it, probably people like me, who had the intention of removing their freedoms and their property and extending the iron grip of government. The word they kept using was control. Climate change is a way of controlling us through a natural element and extending control. This was their word. And we know that, we know that there's plenty of enemy narratives around climate change from people who strongly oppose action on climate change. But the other side are doing it as well. People... I come from the environmental movement, people on my side as well. We're always playing these heroes and villains arguments. In particular, we're often playing stories about, about uh, big oil. And I, don't mi I, mean, I don't mind this, I realise that we're constructing a narrative. Bill McKibben, who of course is uh, founder of 350.org, and I hope that some of you are involved with a disinvestment campaign, is very, self is very conscious about this. He says, no, we're, he says that movements need enemies. He said, oil is the enemy. We're making oil into the enemy. We're playing around with the values here to remove the social license from oil. We're doing this. But I worry about this as well, I have to say. Because I worry, although Bill is very thoughtful, I worry about the extent to which my own side and my own campaign are really quite aware of what we're doing. Uh, we campaign a lot against the Koch brothers. This, for me, is a worrying sign. The, the Koch brothers, $35 billion, uh, petrochemical... Uh, millionaires have invested their money into climate change denial. Well, they invest a small part of it, and they invest in lots of things, to be honest. Um, they often get portrayed as the as the coctopus with their tentangles, tentacles. I'm sorry. Um, the fact that they're portrayed as an octopus shouldn't itself be a warning. This is the latest in a long series of marauding cephalopods um, of uh, monopoly, monopoly capitalism. Uh, there we are, standard oil monopolies. I have incidentally, this is, maybe you can invite me back, I can give a whole presentation on the history of octopus and, uh, in propaganda. Um, I have to say also, as you may very well be aware, unfortunately also Octopi as uh, the uh, international Jewish conspiracy as well. These enemies get created and get given shape in the form that we give them. And this is, this is a problem. 
because once you start creating enemies, other people start creating enemies. And actually, on this issue, which I think above all other is the one where we can say, you know what, we have a common interest in this. We need to get together around our shared values. We have big differences, but we have things we all care about. When we create enemies, the enemy narrative starts to take over and starts to proliferate. And this, as I said, is filling in this cognitive gap, this challenge in climate change. But it is not just individuals which create, or, or campaign groups, entire organizations can create narratives which are distractions. I had a very, I had a very interesting time with Shell, Shell Oil. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you the story because it's, it's a good story. I went to see David Hone, who's their climate change um, advisor, uh, in their headquarters in, uh, in, uh, on the South Bank in London. And as I, as I go in there, up above the reception, there is a big screen. And it's broadcasting constantly on a loop this message from the, from the manager of a Shell building. And he's saying, Shell takes goal zero very seriously. He says, we have a goal of no accidents of any kind. That is goal zero. And here in this building, we urge you to take full precautions. Report any unsafe behavior by your host. Well, I have to say, as an a environmental campaigner, I, can, I, I mean, where, where do I start unsafe behavior by my host? Um, we wish you a very safe day and goal zero. A very safe day. This isn't something that people normally wish me. And as I'm standing there, I'm kind of watching this, thinking, you know, this is, this is odd. I mean, as a, as a, as a cultural anthropologist, I, you know, traveler, I'm going, mm-hmm, curious. They start pointing at me, and the people behind reception. They go, sir? Sir, sir, <laughs> what, what is it? It was sir, 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 your shoelace, sir, your shoelace, sir. It could, you could trip over it and have an accident. <laughs> all right, okay, all right, okay. This is this is this is funny. I go, okay, I like to live dangerously. And I start, I leave them, and I start to make my way up the stairs. There's a kind of revolving stairs which leads up to the, to the meeting room. So I'm meeting David. And as I'm, a, as I'm a few steps up, they're all pointing again. It's the security guards as well who are pointing now. They're going, sir, 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 hold the handrail, sir. Hold the handrail. You can slip on the stairs and have an accident. And <laughs> I look at this thing, and, and all the way up, all the way up the banister rail, there are signs saying, hold the handrail. You could have an accident. Hold the handrail. And even on the steps of the stairs, warning, slippery steps. When I finally sit down with David Hone, he says, hello. I say, hello. He says, George. George, and he's doing this pointing thing again. I'm thinking, oh my god, it's some kind of cult. He says, George, your pen, George. Your pen, George. Your pen could spill. You could have an accident. And I'm like, oh, for heaven's sake. I said, well, well, sir. You know, well, of course, I didn't say it because I was being polite. I couldn't say, well, <laughs> well sir, you know, your, your huge stocks of hydrocarbons could burn up and destroy the future. But. <laughs> But I didn't say that. I was being polite. I actually asked, I actually asked David, I said, David, tell me, tell me what makes you proud to work in, in Shell. Because I always find this a very interesting entree with people. Like, like, tell me about your values. He said, what I like is that Shell is so exciting. We're always in the center of things. He said, I've just been, he said, I've just been to Alberta. And it is amazing what we're doing. They're amazing. The sheer scale that we do things on is extraordinary. Huge engineering achievement. Okay, that's interesting. But I understand how within his mindset, that's how he can see. Because remember, people can interpret anything from any point of view. Here's Shell talking about the Olympus operation, their platform in the Gulf of Mexico. This is Gulf Zero, you'll notice. Goal Zero. We'll foster Goal Zero, goal zero develop people, and maximize production be accomplished with a caring attitude. That's nice. Personal accountability and process efficiency. No harm to people or the environment. Well, that's good to know. Engage every person. Excellent. Diversity, inclusion. Oh, these are all very progressive. Top quarter, quarter producer. <laughs> no oil left behind. <laughs> a, a phrase I've, I've heard somewhere before, or some distant echo. There's this way that entire institutions can create narratives. In this case, Shell seems to have displaced the issue of risk of their activities into a risk of their production. It is interesting in this, I would say, that this is what, what, uh, what social psychologists would call um, creating moral license. That's to say that you have something which is fundamentally unethical, and what you do is you do something on the side. You know, you, 
Yeah, you, you work in Treblinka, but you're nice to your, you know, you're nice to your dog. You do, you do stuff which makes you feel good, which creates for you the internal balance. Just as we know that people who are heavy flyers can often be very dedicated to recycling. We know, and we do this in our own lives as well, but this works on an institutional scale. And this is why this is important, and this is why these issues about why we ignore climate change are important. But it's not just why we ignore climate change, but it's how we construct the stories that determine what we think about it. And people like the people in Shell, who are very smart people, and they're not, in my view, having met quite a few of them, I've never met any of them who I thought was fundamentally a bad person, are nonetheless being able to construct a story around what they do that's self-justifying, and is utterly, utterly deludes them from seeing what is really going on, or rather they construct it in a way which allows them to release. And we must not underestimate our capacity to do that. And very clever people tend to do that kind of bias extremely cleverly. I talked a little bit about non-conversations. So I'm going to move on to that. Um, this is a, there's an intense UN debate going on in this picture. <laughs> this, is, this is the debate on fossil fuel development. Um, the, I talked about how there, was non, how there were non-conversations and were socially constructed silences. Let's put all of that together a little bit. When the United Nations came to work and put together its framework convention on climate change, they had their first meetings in the late 1880s. Sorry, 1980s. 1988, 1989. Which then finally went on to Berlin meeting and so on, on to Kyoto. They were working with information provided by scientists. Scientists were not talking about fossil fuel production. I spoke to Sir John Horton, who is the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the founding chair, and I said, Sir John, when did you ever talk about fossil fuel production? He says, well, of course it's part of a picture. I said, yes, but did you ever talk about it? No. I said, did the IPCC ever talk about it, ever mention it, ever put in anything? It's like, no. I mean, we mentioned that fossil fuels cause climate change, but we never talked about the production of them, no. Because that was a policy issue, and we didn't do policy. So when they then made inventories of fossil fuel, when they did inventories which then fed into that growing international process, those were inventories of greenhouse gas production, not fossil fuels. Fossil fuels were off the picture. At the same time, the international negotiators were dealing with issues that had, were to do with gases. They were taking their precedence. I said the brain is working with metaphor, and the metaphors they had were very successful narratives for dealing with chlorofluorocarbons under the Montreal Protocol, which showed that countries could get together and could manage gases. Or sulfur dioxide emissions, which there was a market trading system which was believed to be a great success in the States. At the same time, in the late 80s into the early 90s, which was also about managing, controlling, and trading in gases. The two metaphors moved forward into the international process. The international process took the inventories of gas production. It took the successful models. And remember, these weren't just models. These were narratives. People felt very, very proud of what they'd achieved with these things. Applied them to climate change. We ended up with a situation where the entire international process was concerned with the monitoring, the evaluation, the rationing, and the marketing of gases. So I said to people who'd worked on the international process for years and years since the very beginning, Sir John Horton, the lead UK negotiator, um, uh, not, I mean, he wasn't the lead UK negotiator, uh, people who as campaigners had worked on it, I said, could you tell me, please, just as I did in, just as I did in um, New Jersey, could you tell me, please, about the conversation which happened about fossil fuel development and production? Not one. I said, could you show me a piece of paper? No, nothing had ever happened. There was no intensive lobbying by oil and gas companies that anyone could think of either, because they didn't need to be. Because if something is not in the conversation, if it's not on the table, if it, is, if it isn't a silence, you can't talk about it. I find this extraordinary, but I also see it as a kind of vindication of what I'm talking about. But things can become removed from the conversation in such a way that they don't, they don't even exist. We have this extraordinary situation now, this cognitive separation in policy and in the minds of policymakers between fossil fuel production on the one side and greenhouse on the other. Hillary Clinton, who just made a speech about how important climate change is, not so long ago went on a state tour when she was state secretary to Norway. And in the same day, she took a ride in the, uh, she took a boat ride up into the Arctic to look at the effects of ice, of ice melt with a group of scientists who were exploring this. She came back saying, that's very serious and very sober. She then had lunch which was a, quite a nice lunch apparently, like a little bit of, a little salmon. You, this would appeal to you, no doubt. And after lunch, she then sat down at a round table with the head of Norwegian Statoil, with a representative of ExxonMobil from the US, and they had a very intensive conversation about how they were going to carve up new oil exploration areas in the Arctic. 
The two things in immediate, well, just like that, just like, just like those things off the web I showed you. The two things in immediate juxtaposition. How can an intelligent, and I, I believe, thoughtful woman like Hillary Clinton do that? Because they're in entirely different cognitive areas. How is it possible for the Science Museum in London to have its atmosphere gallery on climate change with the principal sponsor of Shell? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 to, to be honest, it, it, it beggars belief, I think. But how they can do it is because these things are entirely cognitively separate. So the point I'm making with these examples is that the problems I'm talking about need to be recognized and analyzed because they go deep, deep into, this, into what we talk about. So what, what do we do about this? Well, let, let, let's, let's think about that for a minute. I think one thing is if we recognize that climate change exists primarily in the form of socially constructed narratives, which is what I'm arguing for, we need to recognize that our brains are not why to ignore climate change, but there is the opportunity there to create something which is, a, which is appealing and works for us. I think the greatest disaster of my, the campaign, from my point of view, has been the way that it has become associated entirely with, with the politics and the attitudes of the liberal left and environmentalists. And I say this as maybe liberal left environmentalist. I think it has been a, a tactical and campaign disaster because it has led to a situation where people judge the issue not on the basis of the science or the evidence or their own experience, but on the basis of their dislike, their like or dislike of the people who are seen to hold it. Therefore, for me in my work, the absolute priority is trying to reach out and engage new audiences, both to develop their own language and, and narratives around it, but also to speak about common goals, to say, no, we're not the same, we're very different, we disagree on things, but this is something which surely we can reach across and what we can agree on. Here's an example of how interesting, let me just hold it for a second and then I'll come to it, how, how interesting climate change can, how different it can be when it is taken and held by someone else. Of course, this is one of the reasons why the people who currently hold it are not very keen to let it go. Because when someone else takes control of it, they impose their own values on it. And very often, we might not like the values which go on it. That is the nature of diversity. It requires sometimes things you do not like. Rob Sisson is the president of Conserve America, which is a very conservative Catholic organization. He's doing something very interesting. He's reframing climate change in terms of fetal rights and abortion. You can, read, you can read it for yourself. Doesn't work for me. I have no doubt it would work very well for the millions and millions of Americans who through their religious faith are committed to believing that the rights of the unborn child are a funda fundamental sacred right. I have to confess, I'm not without any views on, uh, without expressing my, my, my views on the issue that he works for, I, I want to see more of this. I want to see this crossing over so that people with very different values to my own are taking hold of this as something which belongs to them. And on a smaller scale, the state of Wisconsin did a great project where each of these, are, I, I recommend you go to this, each of these is a separate person speaking about climate change in their own words, from their own values, and their own interests. Many of these working people, the, the, the Great Lakes shipping guy is great. He's somebody who's been on the Great Lakes his whole time. He is talking about, as a, as a captain of a boat, and he is talking about how climate change feels to him as a, as a sailor. This seems to be massively more interesting than having some professional campaigner talking about it. It's somebody speaking from the heart about their own conviction and their own views. And I also know that it's something which is going to work for others. My own organization focuses on this. Most of these reports are concerned with exactly the issues I'm talking about. The one here at the bottom right is the first report anyone in Britain has written on how do we talk about climate change within the values of centre-right politics. And uh, as soon as I get back to Britain, I'm going to be, doing, I'm going to be conducting interviews with um, members of European Parliament, centre-right members of European Parliament, to understand better how they talk about and frame climate change and to help them to be more effective with their communications of it. Because this is the priority. The centre report there, Hearth and Hiraith, is, is talking about our work in Wales. How across an entire country can we find common language about our national identity, I live in Wales, our national identity and our national pride that can speak to climate change without it all getting bogged down in the issue of you, that group and that group. And the answer is, yes, you can. 
Yes, you can. Just as in British Columbia, there are things that people have in common that they care deeply about that speak across those boundaries. And that, for me, is the area of how we can break this, how we can break this pattern. And also how we can break this enemy dy dynamic, which I think is, is potentially very, very destructive. So I'll just end with that. We have a, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I'd just like to say this. I'm not a writer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a change maker. I'm, I'm, I'm an activist. I'm deeply interested in how the research of some of the people like you in the room, um, of how practical experience can make us more effective at what we do. So there's something, what's operating behind this is a very strong desire to change the, change the way we talk and think about climate change. So I would urge you, please, of course, do read the book. I think you'll find it interesting, as you can tell from my talk. It's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's written to be the kind of book which is actually interesting to read. Most people tell me that they just sit down and read the whole thing, but it's very straightforward. But also, please do follow me on Twitter because what I'm hoping to do is to carry forward these conversations into the wider realm. So please, yeah, please join up and follow me in for what I'm doing. And if you enjoy the book, please share it, because that's the best way of getting these ideas out. OK, thank you very much indeed. Would you like to lead the questions, George? Sure. Tell me how much time we have. Yes, go ahead, please. But just before we go, how much time do we have? We have to wrap up. Uh, that box not useful. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> not. We only have 10 minutes. I'm so sorry, I kept, but I, I went somewhat over. OK. Right. Please, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really amazing presentation. I've been working with Greenpeace for the last year, as uh, right. recently. And I just wanted, you know, while I was at Greenpeace, I really love what the organization stands for and, you know, the value of their campaigns. But I wanted to ask you, from your perspective as a former senior campaigner, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel, what do you, what do you think about, like, the way that Greenpeace is framing oil companies or that, or, or that, like, you know, environmental organizations are framing oil companies? For example, right now, they have this. Uh, they've had a recent campaign where they're um, sort of going after Shell and yeah. then they're going after Lego in order to get at Shell. Yeah. You know, this kind of framing of, of and villainizing of certain companies, I mean, is, is that what you're speaking to? Are you saying that that's the kind of thing that's not helping the environmental movement right. because we're drawing lines and sort of people are feeling um, you know, threatened and whatnot? Uh, I, I think there's a few things there. I think the first thing to say is that it's a campaign-wise, it's perfectly legitimate to go after Shell. <laughs> I mean, they are they are leading in they are leading in uh, tar sands in Alberta. They're the leading company exploring the Arctic. If uh, Greenpeace has very strong reasons for protecting the Arctic, they have a whole Arctic campaign, and therefore Shell is a legitimate target. On the issue of climate change, though, it is a strategic choice to go after oil companies. I want, in, I want environmental organizations to be very clear that they have made that strategic choice on the basis of really weighing up carefully the costs and benefits, including the ones I outline in the book. Because there are costs, and this is not straightforward. Um, I think there's a balance there. On the one hand, I think it is legitimate to go after oil companies because we do need to create a target for our activities. On the other hand, as I point out, it is not straight, as straightforward as the issues I used to work on with forests where there was a logging company that was destroying things. It's like, no, we are, we are all in various ways, um, you know, various ways are a part of this. But really, I guess, the issue I have is that environmental organizations are extremely good at speaking to their own constituencies, their own members, which is great. I th what I want is recognition of these huge, huge, wide open swathes of the public who are not being engaged adequately. Or rather, that by our decision to just speak to the, the group of people we speak to, we are leaving them wide open to the people who oppose action on climate change to speak to their values. So I guess maybe, it's, maybe Greenpeace as a niche operator are not, a great pe not, not great people to do that. But I would, like to see the f I would like to see increasing focus on how to speak to new audiences, have new partners, and actually maybe not to, how to enable those partners to have a parallel conversation. The more we go after the people we care about and our targets, the more we continue to dominate this conversation as a one-sided thing of our domain, and the harder we make it for other people to come in. So, so I don't want to say no to the Greenpeace campaign, it's important, but I so, so want to see something comparable happening with similar vocalness and strength from a very different point of view. Yeah? Otherwise, it's not balanced. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, I darn feel like I learned a few things. It's, oh, it's okay. terrific. Uh, I appreciate all you're saying. I was I came into this with. Uh, let me go back to the, the left brain, right brain yeah. business. Um, I'm a college prep uh, instructor, math and physics, out in one of the other universities nearby, and uh, I've always been concerned about the undergrad students' level of ability to think. Yeah. Learning, for instance, years back, 60% uh, of our, our our colleagues, our undergraduates, um, don't aren't, don't have the ability to think at like formal operations level that Piaget would be talking about. Um, so I. I was looking at that as, as part of the answer. I've been also tremendously disappointed that limits to growth study over the years hasn't been understood and spread around and, and taken into account in that kind of systems thinking, which sort of goes, to, I think, beyond or sideways from, from Piaget's framework. So I was, I was looking at the, at the you know, left brain kind of aspect of it, and I, I wonder how much of that influences what you're talking about. People don't know how to think well enough to, to deal with the issues that we were talking about. It, is it really an, an entirely right brain emotional kind of barriers? Um. No, no, I, I mean, I, I think that we really do know how to think very, very well. I think, I think it is actually, I mean, it's quite innate. I think that we do not reach, I think we, do, we are not able to mobilize ourselves on the basis of, well, I wouldn't say left and right brain, brain but on the basis of a kind of like rational discourse. And but you see, I see it very, very clearly. I see it on the basis of policy makers. But what they need to do is they need to convert stuff into images, into narratives that work. And I think it's fundamental to the way that our brains work. You know, when, when, our, when our rational side is trying to persuade, is trying to get something done, it does it through the form of a story that it tells itself. And sometimes we're not even conscious of doing that. So I'd say we're extremely expert in this. I guess what I'm interested in doing is just opening up the process to say, let's be conscious of the fact that's what we're doing. So let's not fool ourselves that information works on its own. Um, I, but I think, this stuff is, I think this stuff is absolutely fundamental. But that being said, however, there are people who reach policy decisions on the basis of purely rational decision making. There are. So there are people, for example, if you evaluate climate change as a risk, if you are looking at a, at a very rational way at outlining future risks to your company or to your investment and so on, there's every reason why climate change can fit very well into that analysis. But in terms of mobilizing public concern such that people will vote for, will vote for change or might vote for austerity, I think, yeah. I haven't fully answered your question, I know, but yeah. Okay, we might have a, a yeah. question up there. Please. I'm interested in the uh, comments you might make on the question of time. Um, we keep hearing that if we're going to continue to put carbon dioxide and other things into the atmosphere, that time is getting short before massive climate change is irrevocable. Yes. I think that's true. Uh, who knows? Yeah. I'll probably not be around when it becomes irrevocable. How much time do you think it's going to take to switch the narratives, yeah. to move the population uh, to the same realization, and uh, the possibility of taking action? No, it's a very, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, I think what I'm trying to offer is, is as it were, some questions and some analysis not necessarily the full answers. I mean, I'm being very careful not to put forward a manifesto for change in terms of saying we need to do this, because you're absolutely right. We're up against the clock, big time. I think one of the things which that shows is that we do not have time for values change. I'll say that. Values tend to change very, very, very slowly, actually. I mean, I mean, things do change. Things do change. They change intergenerationally, but we don't have a great deal of time. I think we need to speak to where people already are, put it that way. Um, how much time do we have? I, I don't know, but I, my, my own political analysis would be that given that we are living in a democracy where people have a vote, unless we build a larger, a larger constituency of people who care deeply about this, we're not going to be able to move forward. So I don't know if that meets the time scale, which is very, very short, but I think that is not unachievable either. But I think it requires a different form of, yeah, a different form of engagement. Listen, I'm very sorry, uh, but we need to uh, vacate the room shortly. I know there are other questions. Uh, George has a lot of different kinds of contact information up on the board there if you want to continue the conversation with him personally. If you want to dive deeper into the book, it's at, actually at the UBC bookstore and it's on sale. And it, it, it is, I, I did start reading last night, it's extremely readable and even led me to the, uh, what is it, which nasty ass honey badger video. 
which I realized I was the last person in the world to actually do. <laughs> but anyway, it, it is very entertaining, extremely uh, thoughtful read, so I strongly encourage you to read it. This is a conversation that's absolutely uh, critical to all of our futures. Uh, so uh, it's a great way, if you haven't gotten into it, to begin that. And George, yes. Yeah. Just to say, I we need to vacate the room, but I'm going to be around afterwards, so I don't have to head so, off straight so away, do I? That would be right yeah. outside the door here, for those people wanting to continue the conversation. Yeah, but please join me again in thanking George for a great time.